Okay, so we will continue with cryptographic hash functions. So, in the last class, what we have seen is the Merkle Damgaard construction or the iterated construction, and we have also discussed about certain proofs based on which the security of the uh, particular construction is being ascertained, right? Like that, uh, the main claim was that if the compression function was a collision resistant function, then so is the hash function, okay? But as we discussed, that this was under certain assumptions like the assumptions was the, the ideal hash model. Okay. So, if that particular assumption is not being uh, maintained, then these proof systems do not hold, these proofs do not hold. Okay. So, so we will see actually today the pitfalls of this particular construction in the practical world, okay. so where it fails actually. And we will discuss about certain uh, few more definitions among them, one of them is called multi collisions and we will discuss about what is meant by multi collisions and what is meant by multi collision attacks and then there is a phenomenon which we will discuss is called poisoning of messages. Okay. So, these are some practical attacks which are used on hash functions and apart from there, these there are also well, well defined, well structured uh, attacks on hash functions which are called collision finding uh, attacks, but we will not be discussing them. So, we will be concentrating on this, but we will just conclude with certain results on the current status of attacks on hash functions. Okay. So, so, let us start. So, the idea is that we will address this question that is, is an iterated hash function really an ideal function. Okay. So, we shall discuss certain schemes that use Merkle Damgaard hashing. So, therefore, we will discuss about certain attacks and so therefore, the pitfall actually lies in the fact that we essentially have been abstracting it as a black box. Okay. So, this is uh, for example, uh, if you use the double data type to represent real numbers for example. Okay. So, we all know that when we write a piece of software code, then the double data type is used to represent the real numbers, okay. but there is a caveat. What is a caveat? That there is a machine, ma machine dependent precision. right? So, you cannot actually express all possible real numbers. right? So, if you keep the, if you keep these limits in mind, then it is fine, okay? but it is very important to understand these limits. Okay? So, therefore, we will see certain attacks in order to understand really uh, where the proofs fail. Okay. So, what, what are the difference between what I assume in my, uh, what, what we assumed in the last class and what we will see today. Okay. So, in our, in our design of the hash function for aiding the proofs, we have assumed that the hash function is ideal. Okay. So, one important requirement was that in order to learn the value of a hash, uh, then the only way was to compute that that is previous knowledges were essentially not helping in the computation of a new hash value. Okay. Now, this particular fact is exactly violated in the Merkle Damgaard construction. Okay. So, I mean in the in the Merkle Damgaard construction actually this assumption is essentially violated. So, which means that what we can show is that if we know the hash values of certain messages, then we can actually compute the hash values of some other messages. Okay. So, if you are able to show this, then we are essentially violating the ideal hash function assumption. Okay. So, let us consider certain uh, schemes. Okay. So, for example, let us consider certain practical scenarios like the commitment scheme. So, what is a commitment scheme? So, it is a very simple game like you all of us know this, this is a simple auction game. Okay. So, therefore, suppose there is a commodity which needs to be bought and all of you give an auction that is you bid certain values and whoever quotes the smallest value, I mean it is not about, uh, I mean suppose, uh, suppose we buy, want to buy a machine right? and then all of you give some quotations and then among them the quotations are finally opened on a particular date and among them whichever is the lowest value essentially is wins the, I mean is, 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 is the supplier. Okay. So, so, therefore, there can be lot of malice which you can do in this type of games. right? For example, if the person who is actually sitting over and opening those seals, okay, suppose he leaks that information, then what can happen is that and he wants to give that particular order to a particular intended person. Then what you can do is that if that information is leaked, then he can finally what he can do is that he can change that bid value and maybe just make say 1 rupee less than than whoever has whoever, whoever is the uh, runners runners up okay so so therefore this this type of malice can be played 
right so so therefore the so therefore the idea is that if we wish to develop now a digital method without having a central trusted authority okay then we would try to use a one way function why now because the idea of using a one way function here is that if you if you are committing to a bid value then you cannot change that bid value okay so what is the idea the idea is that suppose all of you gives uh, the bid values but you give the bid values through a one way function like maybe use a hash function okay so hash function by definition has this one wayness right so therefore what you can do is that you can just take a value hash it and give the result okay so therefore now your problem lies if you want to do a malice to change the original value keeping the hash value con same right and that is against what i as have assumed as the collision resistant of the resistance of the hash function okay so we can use such kind of uh, i mean we can use hash functions to help us in such kind of scenarios okay so basically the function since the function or the hash function binds the bid to a value and the bid leaking no information about the original commitment okay so why now because why does the bid does not leak any information about the original commitment what property of the hash function guarantees this the pre image property okay so we cannot actually commute very very efficiently the pre image of our hash computation okay but there are certain pitfalls when you do it in real life we will see that so hash functions are engaged for this and the security argument can work like this if f is a one way function then recovering x from fx is a hard problem okay and if f is collision resistant then the commitment can only be x okay otherwise the cheater is actually creating a collision okay and we have actually assumed that creating a collision is not so easy right so therefore you see that in a typical commitment kind of scenario hash functions should be quite handy because of the one wayness property and also because of the collision resistance property right so now what we will see is that in a practical scenario there are certain problems okay so what is the problem <coughs> so suppose that you know that uh, you know for example let us consider certain scenarios like suppose the attacker knows what are the possible bid, bid values okay so suppose i know that my cost cannot exceed say 10 lakh rupees it's a finite number right so what you can do is that you can compute 10 lakh hash values and then the collision resistance property actually doesn't mean anything right you can always compute a new hash value and can 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 tell whether it matches or not right so therefore you see that but if the attacker creates hash of all possible values and compare with the with the bid then actually the one wayness property doesn't come into play because you can you can probably try to find out what is the pre image of a given hash value okay so although your hash value is a pre image resistant hash function but if your domain is actually so small like say 5 lakhs or 10 lakhs then you can actually compute those hash values and you can predict the image i mean the pre image okay so the other thing is that that the adversary can create so therefore what the collision resistant guarantees is that you cannot actually given a hash function hash value say hx you cannot compute two x values like x and x dash which are distinct and which results in the same hashed output okay but the adversary what he can do is that instead of creating two x values which results in the same hashed output okay outputs two x values which results in a related hashed output do you understand what i mean so what is the thing i mean so what you what you need is that you need two x values say x and x dash okay such that your collision resistance guarantees that if x and x dash are not the same then hx and hx dash are exactly the same right but in this particular scenario what the attacker can do is that the attacker can create two x values x and x dash where x and x dash are not the same such that hx is less than hx dash okay so here is a, an example of a relation right so the collision resistant property does not give you any guarantees against this kind of 
intention right so you see that collision resistant or whatever we define as the requirements of my hashed function security actually does not cover this kind of malice right so uh, i mean another simple example could be where a cheater simply copies the bit value okay so therefore so these are some practical pitfalls that can happen if you apply a hash function okay so one way of overcoming this would be to use identity that is suppose i mean i not only compute the hashed output but i also engage a corresponding identity value like like suppose each of you has got an ib has got an iv value or rather an identity value and you not only compute the hashed output but you also use the corresponding identity also okay so so there are certain kind of uh, applications that we will discuss also uh, it's called message authentication codes okay so the the other thing which you use is is in in a message authentication code i think we have also addressed this it's called a keyed hash function okay so therefore you not only compute the hash of a bit value and hash of your own identity but you also have a symmetric key okay so therefore th that symmetric key gives you the guarantee that only say for example alice or for example bob who is i mean legal to use are essentially using the uh, computing the hash value okay so this gives you certain guarantees okay so therefore we have got the idea of message authentication codes which we will discuss in our subsequent classes but since we know the definition of max let us consider this particular example so what is a message authentication code it's a keyed hash function right so first of all we will try to understand that using a an iterated construction of a hash function like what the markel damgard construction says computing a mac is not not allowed okay so we cannot use the normal iterated hash function to compute the mac okay so for example how can i use the iterated hash function to compute a mac i can simply change that iv value to a key value okay and that should give me an easy way of computing the mac okay but then there are problems okay so we will try to address such kind of pitfalls okay so what is a mac used for the mac is used to verify the integrity and the authentication of information so this we have discussed in the first days class okay so what the what alice does is typically takes m computes hkm and appends m and hkm and sends it in the traffic okay bob collects it checks for the validity of the pair okay so this prevents the adversary from tampering the message so that gives you integrity and also forces bob to believe that it actually came from alice and that gives you authentication right so this is the typical use of a message authentication code okay so max security is thus based on the property that previous knowledge or prior knowledge again does not helps you to compute the mac of a new value okay so if you are able to compute the mac of a new message using previous mac computations then does that is not allowed okay so your underlying assumption behind the security is that you are not able to compute the mac of a new message based upon the mac of previous messages okay so therefore if you had an ideal kind of hash function this was quite easy to do so ideal hash function because this ideal hash function would have given you by definition the property that a new hash function computation depends only on that particular hash value and you cannot compute that from previous values okay but the problem lies with using a, an iterated hash function like for example the sha1 okay so what is the problem so I, although i have not discussed what is a sha1 you can always uh, go back and read uh, from stinson but it is i mean the underlying principles are exactly the same as that we have used in the markel damgard construction okay only there are specific proposals for the compression function there are, it's more defined right so but in a, in a sha1 ha, i mean since you know the idea i mean uh, i think we will be able to understand this that is typically you have got a key length of 80 bits okay so therefore you take assume that there is a key length of 80 bits so what the adversary does is that i mean for example suppose there is a message m whose length is 256 bits okay and i want to compute the hashed output the keyed hash output so what does he do he takes k he concatenates with m and then computes the corresponding hashed output right so since you know that this is an iterated hash function 
So, that means what? That means the compression function will be applicable again and again. Okay. So, the resultant output is actually a 160 bit output that means T which is a tag is a 160 bit result. Okay. So, what will the compression function work on? It will work on K and it will, will and it will take this this output that is taking m and the corresponding k you have got a total of 256 plus 80 so what is that you have got 256 plus 80 so that is 336 bits okay so 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 in the in the sha hash function or rather any iterator hash function we have seen that there is an initial step which is called the pre processing step right so in a pre processing step what you do first is that you take the message x okay and you convert that to a corresponding value of y right so what you do first is like this you take x okay and you pad the subsequent thing by 1 okay and then you add certain values of zeros okay and then finally, you write the 64 bit representation of 64 bit representation of the length. Length means length of the message. Okay. So, in this specific example, you had x of 336 bits. Okay. So, you will have first of all x followed by a 1 and followed by how many paddings will you do is defined by 447 minus the length of the message mod 512 that is a thumb rule that is a formula. Okay. So, you can see the description and you will follow that. Okay. So, you take 447 and from there subtract 336. So, what do you get? I think you get 111. right? So, basically what you do is that you add here 111 zeros. Okay. So, I write 0, 111 and then you write the binary representation of the or the decimal representation, I mean the binary 64 bit representation of the length. So, that is 64 representation of 336. Okay. So, that will follow in the follow next. So, totally you have got 112 bits here, you have got 336 bits here and you have got 64 bits here. Okay. So, what does that add up to? Yes. So, you get 512. Okay. So, you see that the compression function takes 512 straight away and results in an out results in the output. Okay. So, now what you can do is that you can take the compress function and you can directly apply the compress function here this is what you have seen. So, you have got 1 and there are 111 zeros followed by the 64 bit representation of the length. Okay. So, so therefore, now you take this apply this compression function and you obtain the resultant output tag. Okay. So, therefore, given a message value m you know the corresponding tag value the attacker has obtained that. Okay. So, now let us from this particular m let uh, we can easily construct an a value m dash which is nothing but you take m and then follow that up with 100 i mean take m follow that up with 112 bit of padding 64 bit encoding of 336 followed by an arbitrary text t so therefore you take m dash in this fashion you take this and you uh, and you concatenate that with an arbitrary text t okay so which means that uh, you take k and there should be an m here okay which is missing so there is an m here followed by this particular string followed by the text t. Okay. So, what is the hash output of this particular text? So, it will result in can you can you say what will be the resultant output of this uh, hash output? If I want to compute the hash of m dash then what should be my result? So, the first output will be t right? and t I know. Then subsequently it will be again the paddings certain paddings followed by again the decimal the binary 64 bit binary representation of the length of m dash right so therefore this particular output i mean the since i know the corresponding hash output it is easy to easy for me to predict what will be the hash output of m dash also 
Okay. So it works like this. Sir, yeah. What was k in the previous line? Something which I don't know. It's an 80 bit secret. Okay. So I don't know the value of k and I don't know need the value of k, that is the point. So but I know the value of t, that is a corresponding 80 bit digest of this particular m. Okay. So now because of this iterated construction, this will be only this, right? You take the first application will be C applied over K appended with M followed by this uh, this representation, then again a subsequent application of the C function, right? So you see, you see that this is nothing but C applied over T followed by T appended with some padding plus length, okay? So in the right hand side of this, everything is known to me because I know what is the padding required because I know the length, okay? And therefore the all the all the quantities on the right hand side are known to the attacker. Okay? So you see that you can actually easily forge the corresponding key hash. So therefore you see that such kind of iterated construction cannot be straight away applied to construct the key hash output. Okay? You cannot take SHA1 straight away and make it a MAC. You have to do something different. Do you understand that? Yeah. But the key is secret, right? A key I do not know. No, no, I am not, we are not forging the key. So, the, the main idea was this, that is wh where do I require the MAC? The MAC is required to give integrity of the data, right? So, therefore, I give you an M value and I give you an HK M value. So, now if I can actually change M to M dash and also give you an HK M dash which is valid, then the receiver will accept this pair, right? And that is not allowed, right? That is not what MAC should provide. And that is what you are doing here, right? You are changing m, modifying m to m dash, for which you have a valid corresponding hash output, right? So, in other words, you can compute a valid tag on m dash by applying the compression function, and therefore the naive MAC construction, which is based on the iterative hash function, can be easily broken, right? So, therefore, this is not permissible. Right? So now we will uh, take up another problem, which is called uh, it's called Jauks's attack because of the name of the attacker discovered. It is called Anton Zooks. So so the idea is this that the security of cas cas cascaded hash functions was shown was shown to be weak under a particular type of attacks, which is called multi collisions. Okay. So he, so what is a so therefore if you take a generic collision finding algorithm, then the then the idea is that if you, if there is an n n block hashed output, then if you do two power of n by two trials, then you should get one hashed output, right? So why 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 should you get one output because of this? Because of because of Bardet paradox. Okay. So suppose you have got two hashed or hash functions like g h. So you take so uh, so you, in, uh, g and h are each of them are hash functions, which means that you take a zero one infinite length string and compress that into a 0 1 n bit output okay and each so therefore each of them has got an ideal security of 2 power n by 2 okay so suppose i i am intended in making a hash function whose ideal security should be 2 power n okay so a simple proposal could be like i take gm and i append that with hm right so therefore what is the corresponding length of the output it is 2n right so therefore i am expecting an ideal security of 2 power n Yes or no, right? So therefore, suppose I'm trying to do that. Okay, so can I do that? That was the idea. Okay. So this indeed works, but in that case, both the hash functions has to be ideal. Okay. We claim that if it it will fail if only one of the hash functions is actually an iterated hash function. Okay. So so therefore, because of a particular phenomenon which is called multi collision. So what is a multi collision? Multi collision is nothing but a collection of several messages which will hash to the same output. Okay. So, therefore, you, previously you had only two messages which were resulting in one hashed output, but now we are considering a case or scenario where there are several messages or there is a pool or treasure of messages which are actually hashing to the same result. Okay. So, what is the amount of, uh, so therefore, we have considered actually the two collision problem, 
but what about a multi collision problem ok. So, in that case it means what we are considering is that instead of two masses being colliding we are interested in finding out that m masses are colliding ok. So, can you tell that I mean so I mean for example, what we have previously covered is the m equal to 2 case right, but when I extend this m to say 3, 4 or more than that then it becomes a hard combinatorial problem to construct the probabilities and also give an estimate ok. So, for that actually, but we can actually obtain quite good approximations using the idea of Poisson's distribution ok. So, what is a Poisson's distribution? So, so idea is that, uh, so therefore, the idea is as follows that is, so you know that there is a uh, for example, you take binomial distribution ok, you take binomial distribution that is x is a basically a random variable which follows binomial binomial distribution ok. And then you also assume that the correct, so therefore, you can actually represent this by n comma p right. So, n means the number of independent trials that you do and p is the corresponding probability right. So, if you find that p is quite small value that is p is small and n is large ok, ok then n p is a finite value then actually you can represent or say that x actually follows a distribution called Poisson's distribution and there you can write that p x equal to i ok. You can write this as e power of minus lambda lambda power i divided by i factorial ok, where i is nothing but 1 2 and so on ok sorry 0 1 2 and so on ok. So, so, what is the idea? So, what is so in our case you can imagine in the particular case of m equal to 2 ok. So, what we were interested is in the fact that no two people essentially were born on the same day right. So, you can consider this as a trial right. So, therefore, how many trials are you doing among say n number of people? So, if there are say n people ok or n objects and there are n possibilities. So, in our case in a case of a birthday question there are 365 possibilities right. So, what is the number of independent trials that you are doing? You are actually doing n c 2 number of independent trials right. And what is the probability that two people were born on the same day or result in the same possibility? It is 1 by n ok. So, the probability is actually 1 by n in that case right. So, this lambda is actually nothing but the expected value. So, therefore, it says that it is n into p ok. So, in our case this lambda will be equal to n c 2 into 1 by n right. So, what we are consider if we consider that p x equal to 0 what does it mean? It means that no two people were born on the same day that is the 0 success case right. So, what will be 0 success case resulting? It will be only e power minus lambda and that is equal to e power of minus n c 2 by 1 by n right. So, suppose and, and therefore, the probability that there will be at least two people who are born on the same date will be actually 1 minus this. So, there is 1 minus n c 2 1 by n and I approximate that to 0 0.5 right. So, from there actually you get this uh, fine uh, approximation of that n being order of square root of n right. You take uh, this to this side you get 0 0.5. So, then you get you can take ln, uh, log n on both sides from there you can get this right. Do you follow this? Because you can also approximate this by 1 minus e power of minus n square by n n c 2 you can approximate by n square. So, now you can actually use this uh, method. So, you see that this matches with whatever you got combinatorially also ok. So, now can you use this particular technique to solve the m case that is the m way case I think it is quite straightforward now ok. How you can do is this that is when you are considering m cases ok. So, then your lambda will be equal to n c m ok divided by 1 by 
n to the power of m minus 1. Right? So, now you are considering this p equal x equal to 0, this will result in e power of minus n c m by 1 by n power of m minus 1. Yes or no? So, therefore, this actually can be approximated as e power minus n to the power of m divided by 1 by n to the power of m minus 1. So, again by writing like 1 minus e to the power of n to the power of m by n to the power of m minus 1, that is the probability that at least m people results in the same possibility. Okay. So, this if I make it 0.5, then you get e power of minus n to the power of m by n to the power of m minus 1. So, if I make this like this is equal to 2. Okay. So, if you take ln on both sides, you get n power m by n to the power of m minus 1 equal to ln 2. Right. So, that means that <coughs> n power m equal to ln 2 into n to the power of m minus 1. So, therefore, n is of the order of n to the power of m minus 1 by m. So, here you can put the value m equal to 2 and check that it satisfies the previous case. Okay. So, so therefore, now in a, so therefore, when you are considering an m collision problem, you would assume that your security should be of this level in an ideal case. Right. So, that we will see that actually is not provided in the multi collision problem. Okay. So, just keep this result in your mind. Okay. I would, of course, you can see the deduction, but you can keep the result in mind. So, how do you violate this? So, you see that suppose assume that the first part that is the g part actually is an ideal hash is not an, not an ideal hash function, but is actually a Merkel Damgaard hash function. Okay. So, that means that you can actually if you consider on the corresponding compression function you can actually find a collision of c by trying 2 power of n by 2 times, you can actually create these two message pairs right m 1 0 and m 1 1, which will result in the same output of the compressed function. Okay. So, your compressed function works results in n bit output now, therefore, you can use the birthday paradox and you can predict that in m in 2 power n by 2 trials of the order of 2 power n by 2 trials, you can actually find two messages which will result in the same compressed output. Right. So, now if you continue this for k times because of this iterated nature, you can actually prepare such kind of message pairs which will also result in the same hashed output. So, now you see that these two the first step you have got h 1 for example, right. The both the h 1s were same. This is what is the chaining variable in the next hashed uh, comp compressed output and therefore, these two also are the same. Do you see that? So, what it means that is that your collision function or the your com your collision function results in n bit output right so therefore using two power of n by two types of i mean trials you can actually create two messages which will result in the same compressed output so you can create m10 and m11 so both these two things suppose the compressed function if you apply on this and this you get h1 right this h1 is used in the next compression function called computation right and then again using 2 power of n by 2 trials, you can create two subsequent message pairs. right? Do you follow this? So, pictographically this will look like this. So, suppose you have got this compressed function, you have got this compressed function and you have got this compressed function. Okay? So, what you are doing is that each time you are taking certain portions from the message and there is an initial uh, vector okay? and then you compute this again you take a portion from the message and again you take a portion from the message and you keep on continuing in this fashion. right? So, suppose if you target this particular compressed function in 2 power of n by 2 trials, you can actually create two messages here which will result in the same output. right? So, since at this point again you are same, you can continue this and again create two message pairs here which will result in the same output, create two message pairs here which will result in the same output. Right. So, therefore, 
Now, actually, how many such message pairs you can create? You can actually create 2 power k such message pairs, right? Because you can change those values, right? There are two possibilities for every for every k bit vector. There are two 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 possibilities, right? So therefore, using this kind of a technique, you can actually create 2 by 2 to the power of k pairs, which will result in the same hashed output. Okay, for g x. So now, if you take k is equal to n by 2, okay, so then do you expect that for h x also you will find at least one pair which will collide? Yes, because of the birthday paradox, right. So in that case you see that how many times have you tried this effort? You have tried of the order of n 2 to the power of n by 2 times, right, because it was actually k 2 to the power of n by 2 times, but if you keep k equal to n by 2 then it is O n to the power of n by 2. So, in O n to the power of O n to the power of n by 2 trials, you can actually find out a hashed out 2 messages which will result in the same hashed output for the concatenated hash function also, right. But what was the level of expected security? 2 to the power of n. So, you see that you are getting much less, right. And you are also getting much less than what you had expected because what you were expecting is O n to the power of m minus 1 by m. So, if n is in this case 2 power of, uh, so in a in a multi in a uh, in this case it will be for example, uh, for, even for the first case that is for this corresponding output that is for g, okay. This if you substitute by n then it is m minus 1 by m, right. And actually, what you are getting is you are you are you are getting this in a much lesser number of a lesser effort. Okay, so you see that even the multi-collision claim is not being supported or is not being maintained. Okay, so this actually was is a very fairly straightforward attack. But the main point is that to observe this and to really convert this into an attack. So therefore, there lies the novelty of and doing Juxus work, okay. So, this attack is commonly known as the multi collision problem and here are the details. He says that now you have a treasure of collisions, any message which has the form of this will collide and therefore, there are 2 power of k such messages many times more than what one would have found in time k to the power of n by 2 had g been ideal. So, therefore, in time k to the power of n by 2 actually you would have got you if, if g would have been ideal you would have got far lesser number of colliding messages okay but here you have got 2 to the power of k messages which is quite large okay so that is the main idea so so therefore this is the, the details of this uh, thing so therefore you can see this okay so i'll just conclude with certain uh, uh, demo which I had prepared uh, to show you. I mean, it's it's a, I mean, it's an attack which was made by Lux and Dom. So it says that uh, often theoreticians say that this does not work in practice because what you can do is that you can. Uh, I mean, for example, if I change an m value, okay, to an m dash value, and suppose that m dash value is a rubbish value, okay, for which it collides, then automatically when you see a rubbish value, you will at the end. I mean, at the receiver end you will immediately figure out that there has been some malice, right. So, therefore, you have to not only change the value of m to m dash, but also you have to keep in mind that m dash should make sense, right. So, there are more restrictions, okay. So, therefore, uh, and the problem is because that the colliding string is with a large probability always meaningless, right. So, therefore, this should be quite easy to detect, okay. But the attack has got lot of practical aspects and we will see one demo for this, okay. So, so, here are two files, okay. Just see these two files, okay. So, you see that there is a letter here written about a particular person, and it says that it is quite good, like she is quite, uh, I mean, it is about Alice and written that the performance is quite good and things like that, okay. So, we can imagine this as a recommendation letter, okay. So, suppose this particular letter is being modified like this. So, Alice has been a moderate student and she has been quite casual in an approach to the class, okay. <laughs> so, suppose you do this, okay. So, and suppose some of your not so well wishers do this, okay. 
So and 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 what you do is that when you submit, you also give the corresponding hashed result, right? There is, for example, the MD5 sum. So when you submit to your conference websites, also a journal website, you will see that they often report a MD5 sum of whatever you submit, right? So therefore, suppose there can be a malice which is played of this type. So here is an example which shows. So you see that the two hash values are exactly same. I hope you are able to see it, right? Now it becomes even poorer. Are you able to see it? Anyway, so the idea is that the both the hash values are the same. Okay. So as you see, this is quite dangerous, right? So therefore, if you do such kind of things, it it can be quite harmful. And this is a very simple example, but you can actually play a lot of problems in financially also through these type of things, right? And I just showed a toy example, but you can actually do havoc with that kind of things, right? So what, where is the problem? The problem is because it's quite simple actually. So the I mean the visual demonstration is probably more charming. Okay, so the reason is quite simple is because of this fact that there is a phenomenon called because of this iterated hash nature. What you can do is that you can take a string like this, and you can actually poison one of the one of the corresponding strings to say n dash, and keeping the rest of the things intact. Okay, so the idea is that if you can properly hide these two things, that is n and n dash, such that still the I mean I mean the hashed outputs are exactly the same, but the thing is that if you can properly hide these two value values, then you can actually demonstrate such kind of things. Okay, so in a I will tell you the trick. That is, what I have actually done, computed the MD5 is actually over an APS file, right? A PS file, and a PS file is not an ASCII text, right? It's a program basically. So if yeah, so if you open the PS file, you will find that there is a particular. You can write an if else statement there actually, right? So therefore, therefore you can write. There are two values like, I mean, uh, the syntax which I've used is like this. That is, suppose R1. R two, okay, and then there is there are two texts here, okay, so and there is an if else ending over here, okay. So therefore now if R one and R two are equal, then the first one results, and if R one and R two are not the same, then the second text results, okay. So if you open my PS file in normal uh, any VI editor, okay, don't use Emacs or don't use Notepad because then there are certain things for which the MD five sum gets changed actually. Use Normal VI editor, it will work fine actually. Okay, so you take R1. If you see that R1 and R2 are, so what what is done is that the first part, the first letter is written in this bracket, and the second letter is written in this bracket. Okay, so when you are see, uh, and what what I have changed is in both the cases the R2 is same, and what I have modified is only this R1 value. But this R1 value is a value which you are not visually seeing, right? You are seeing only this part, or you are seeing this part when you are opening the PS file, right? In a ghost view or in a PDF reader. Okay, so you are seeing only the first part. I mean, you are seeing only this part or this part, and therefore you can prop, you can actually hide this poisoning here. Okay, so therefore the lesson to be learned from this is that when you when you uh, sign something, then sign an ASCII text, not a program. Okay, because programs you can actually do a lot of manipulations. So now I will conclude again. I mean, there are some definitions that I thought of mentioning. There are some weaker collisions existing in literature. Something which is called pseudo collisions, free start collision, and near collision. Okay, just see the definitions because of the completeness actually. So, okay, so what is a pseudo collision? The pseudo collision is like if there are two pairs like h comma x and h dash comma x dash. Okay, we say that there is a pseudo collision if c h comma x and c h dash comma x dash are the same. Okay. So here, h comma x and h dash comma x dash are different. Okay, so this is an example of a pseudo collision. So where is the difference? So difference is that I am also assuming certain controls over h and h dash. Okay, so therefore this is if you do such kind of if you really find such kind of pseudo collisions of the compressed function of a hash function, okay, then this is not an attack on the hash function because you cannot really actually control the chaining variable of the in this type. Okay, and mostly actually the h 
the h value is the same it is fixed because that derives i mean the input h is actually fixed by the iv okay therefore the chaining variables are also you cannot really control the chaining variables in that of that type but what you actually have done is that if you find a system, if you find a property like this then the markel damgaard proof that we discussed in the last days class does not hold true okay so therefore the proof does not work and that is quite dangerous also okay the other the other kind of property is called a free start collision this is a even stronger attack which says that if h comma x and h comma x dash are essentially colliding in the complex function so here you see that i have assumed that both the hash values are the same okay but it is a fixed value so that means that i am again assuming control over the hash output i mean over the chaining variable which is not again a full fledged attack on the it's not a collision attack on the hash function so therefore it's called a weaker collision okay and the other quite simple thing is called near collision which says that if x and x dash are said to nearly collide if the hamming distance between the hash of x and x dash are small therefore if you compute the hash of x and if you compute the hash of x dash they differ in say one or two bits okay so these kind of findings like collision attacks these are generally thought to be precursors to full fledged attacks okay so therefore if you find a property of this type then people sits okay maybe i can convert this to an attack okay so so this is some example i mean some thing from the literature i mean these are results are of 2005 so they are slightly old so these are some like md4 md5 sha0 and sha1 so you see that there are various attacks that have been done on them like collision attacks pseudo collision attacks free start collision attacks and so on okay but these are some re reduced down attacks which have been sh shown here but but there are actually i mean of the recent days there have been much more advancements in collision findings and no more the current hash standards like md4 md5 or sha are supposed to be good hash functions okay so what you will find that there is if you want details you can go to this hash function lounge and you can find details there and uh, also there is a call for participation from nist which says that they ask for proposals for more i mean hash functions uh, sub proposals and uh, there are already the compilation has started and in around 2012 there will be i mean it is expected that around 2012 there will be a new hash function standard okay so people from the world have actually submitted hash function and there is this you can actually go to the website and see what is the current st standard so there are lot of hash functions which are being proposed okay so if you are able to find out vulnerabilities in these proposals you can also post to them and they will be again concerned i mean i mean considered in the evaluation of the standards okay so these are some references that i have used i have used douglas tinson also and uh, and the other references which i have used are as follows so you can read this paper by mironov it's very nice survey on hash functions okay and and uh, this uh, poisoning attack which i told you is by dom and lux and it is uh, was discussed in the ram session of eurocrypt in 2005 and obviously there's a multi collision attack on uh, which was discussed by uh, discussed uh, it was developed by anton zuks and it was published in crypto 2004 so these all these papers are available online so you can go and see them okay so next day we will continue with message authentication course